the end of the 18th century, the most glorious kingdom in Europe would face a mighty foe, the power of its own people. One man would rise to inspire the nation, to cast aside a reluctant king and a hated queen. And a new republic would be born in blood, the blood of the French Revolution. Seventeen ninety four, the Conciergerie prison in Paris, an impenetrable fortress on the banks of the Seine, dank, rat infested. It is known as Death's Antechamber. Inside, what was once the voice of the nation is about to be silenced. As his hair is shorn and his neck laid bare for the blade of the guillotine, Maximilian Robespierre is about to be fed to a monster of his own creation. The French Revolution has reached its pinnacle of violence. The French Revolution is this extraordinary moment when people began to believe that you could actually recreate almost everything in a society, that you could not only change the politics, the institutions, but you could change human nature itself through political action. The French Revolution really does constitute the crossroads of the modern world where everything begins to turn in a different direction. The revolution saw a feudal land turn its back on aristocratic tradition and chart a violent new course towards the future. It would shake the very foundations of Europe and its impact would be felt across the world. The French Revolution is the most important event in Western history. There are developments that can rival it, like the Industrial Revolution, like capitalism, but if you mean an event, I can't think of anything more important. It was the revolution that upset things the most. I mean, again, when you consider that it got rid of the Catholic Church, it got rid of Christianity, it got rid of the nobility, it got rid of the king, it got rid of all these things. The French Revolution would bring bread to the poor, democracy to France, and would establish a whole new order of society. But progress would come at a price. It was really a moment of extraordinary hope, extraordinary ambition, and then it turned into this most horrific tragedy. Now broken and defeated, Robespierre, not two days before, had stood triumphant at the head of the greatest political revolution in Europe's history. So true to its ideals, he was called the incorruptible. So powerful, his slightest utterance could cloak an entire city in fear. A master orator, Robespierre's words were his weapons. Now, silenced by a bullet to the jaw, he awaits the same swift and brutal end that he has ordained for so many others. The French Revolution is about to devour its chief architect. No one could have foreseen the turbulent times ahead on one spring day in 1770. The Chateau of Versailles is packed to its gilded rafters with the glittering crowds of the royal court. Completed in 1682, Versailles was the vision of King Louis XIV. To put some distance between himself and his subjects, Louis XIV removed himself from Paris and established a new residence at this small town 12 miles west of the capital. Here he ordered the construction of the most magnificent palace in Europe. For nearly 100 years, it has been the seat of the nation's unwavering monarchy. Today, it is host to a very important wedding. King Louis XV's grandson, Prince Louis Capet, next in line to the throne, is about to take a bride. Just 15 years old on the eve of his wedding, Louis Capet is bashful and hesitant, with few of the characteristics expected of a future king. Louis was this pudgy, shy, painfully inadequate 15-year-old with absolutely no social graces at all. Louis XV's mistress, Madame du Barry, called him a fat, ill-bred boy. Basically, he was just a schlub. It was very hard for Louis to come to 
decisions. He dithered incessantly. He was always ready to be persuaded by the last person he had talked to. Again, those are usually not considered good leadership qualities. Louis' marriage is a political union between Austria's royal family, the Habsburgs, and his own, the Bourbons. The wedding symbolizes the end of an ancient rivalry and the birth of new alliances. The young bride-to-be arrives in France, a wide-eyed and pretty 14-year-old girl, Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette is an Archduchess of Austria. She's the youngest daughter of the Empress Maria Theresa. And she comes to France as part of a marriage deal which represents a great reversal of alliances whereby for the first time in living memory, France and Austria become allies rather than enemies. Marie Antoinette comes to France as a political gesture, but as a teenager, she has little interest in political affairs. Well, when Marie Antoinette came to Versailles, she was very young. She didn't know a great deal about the country she was coming to. She didn't know about the customs. She didn't know about the court. She was certainly a headstrong girl, a very lively girl, um, but she was still a girl. When Marie Antoinette comes to Versailles, she is just a teenager. She is 14 years old, blonde, with blue eyes. She is pretty. She likes being attractive to people, and she comes with the intention of winning over her husband and her new family. On the night of the wedding, there is an ominous storm. But inside, the grandeur of the ceremony lights up the palace as the newlyweds make their way to the royal bedroom. In a ceremony that symbolically ensures the conception of an heir, the king's courtiers are present as the awkward young couple is presented in the marriage bed for the first time. The crowd is delighted and expectations are high. But once the curtains are drawn, it's clear that an heir will not be so easily produced. Louis was not only not interested in ruling, Louis wasn't particularly interested in loving either. And he paid her no attention on the first nights uh, or even further into their marriage. Many years will pass before the marriage is finally consummated. The lack of an heir will soon spark gossip across the kingdom that will plague the couple for years to come. The grand wedding gala continues for days, but outside Versailles, there is less cause for celebration. Years of neglect by a royal government have left the French people deprived and hungry. Seven years earlier, Louis XV had lost the Seven Years' War in which Britain had relieved France of most of her North American colonies. The ill-fated contest nearly bankrupted the country. France's coffers were nearly empty, even though its population was growing bigger every day. With diseases like the plague a distant memory, fewer people were dying, but more and more were hungry. France grew from 20 million to 26 million in the 18th century after having grown only 1 million in the preceding two centuries. That put tremendous strain on what was there, and so there was a lot of anxiety. Four years after the royal wedding, Prince Louis's grandfather, Louis XV, loses his final battle with smallpox. The king dies defeated and unpopular and leaves behind a country on the brink of chaos. In a lavish ceremony, young Prince Louis ascends to the throne and is crowned King Louis XVI. Despite the grandeur of his coronation, Louis is aware that he is woefully unprepared for the job. Louis XVI, the moment his grandfather dies and it suddenly is clear that he's king, he doesn't know what to do. He feels as if the world is falling in upon him. So although he's been educated in the full expectation of becoming king, he doesn't feel ready for it. For a kingdom in crisis, Louis XVI is not the ideal pilot. The 20-year-old king prays, protect us, Lord, for we reign too young.
Ensconced in their royal apartments in Versailles, Louis and Marie Antoinette begin their new lives as young monarchs. While only 12 miles away in Paris, another new era is flourishing. One that is on a collision course with the monarchy itself. It is a dangerous new age of ideas. The age of enlightenment. As the royal carriage approaches the prestigious Louis Le Grand College in Paris, the crowds gather for a glimpse of pomp and celebrity. The newly crowned king, Louis XVI, and his young wife are being welcomed to Paris. At the head of the welcome party is a promising young law student, Maximilien Robespierre. When Robespierre was a schoolboy, the king visited the college and Robespierre gave a Latin address to the king. So he actually spoke to Louis XVI when he was a teenager. As Robespierre respectfully delivers his Latin soliloquy, the king hardly notices the boy. But years later, their fates will again intertwine under very different circumstances. It was one of these rituals that take place in every school, and yet, of course, it was so charged with irony, because here you had the young Robespierre reading this discourse in honor of the man he would later kill. For now, the welcome is warm and the flattery effusive. But although the grandeur of the monarchy can still excite adulation and loyalty, parts of French society are beginning to question its role. Since the Middle Ages, French society had been divided into three classes, or estates, dictated by birth. There was a vast gap between the wealth of the first two estates, the nobility and the clergy, and the rest of France. During the 18th century, new thinkers began to use reason and science to challenge all such traditions. A new intellectual spirit of the age brings everything under fresh scrutiny, judging it according to criteria of rationalism, and humanitarianism. France is alive with new discoveries and debates. It is the age of enlightenment. The enlightenment is a movement which says don't trust authority, don't trust anything that you've been told by anybody else at all, think it out for yourself, test it for yourself. In old regime Europe, you were told what to think. You were given information from above by your rulers, by your priests. And so the idea that you could map out all of human knowledge and then have access to it was revolutionary. In exclusive salons across Paris, Aristocrats gather to discuss Enlightenment authors and the burgeoning age of reason. Voltaire, Rousseau, fresh voices who champion liberty, control of one's own destiny, and religious tolerance. The passion for this new literature is evident amongst the aristocracy. But as Enlightenment ideas trickle through all levels of society, the drive for equality will begin to threaten the aristocratic way of life. What makes it dangerous is it means you will eventually question why are aristocrats the ones with privilege? Can't we change the world to make it a better place? Isn't progress possible? All of that will eventually undermine the idea that monarchy is natural, aristocracy is natural, and hierarchy is natural. To see Enlightenment ideals in action, one has only to look across the Atlantic where the Americans struggle for independence from France's nemesis, Great Britain. King Louis wants revenge for his grandfather's defeats and sees an opportunity in the American War of Independence. French military intervention costs the country 1,500 million livres, money raised from borrowing and taxing poverty-struck peasants. The enormous bill hastens an impending financial crisis. America bankrupts France, in effect, because the debt which the French monarchy incurs in order to fight the American War of Independence 
turns out to be absolutely crucial in the financial situation of the French monarchy because the French monarchy cannot pay those debts.